And good evening. My name is Evan Weiner, and I want to thank Anna for uh, inviting me to uh, the library tonight, uh, albeit on Zoom. And uh, I'm going to talk about the early days of TV, but let me give you a little background on me uh, before we go. Uh, I've been doing radio and TV work since I'm 15 years old, 1971, started at Spring Valley High School. Uh, in 11th grade, when uh, my English teacher, Joe Dionisio, said, you got a good voice, how would you like to be on radio? And I said, I want to be on radio in the worst way. And I was. We did a high school show. We were on the commercial radio station, WRKL, 910 on the dial. And uh, Joe also uh, opened the door for me to work at the Nyack Journal News, along with the uh, Hackensack Bergen record. And uh, I still keep in touch with Joe. He still calls me student. I call him Joe, and uh, I thank him because he opened a lot of doors for me uh, while I was in high school in 1971. Uh, I was a year ahead in school. I was out of school by 21, and I ended up on WNEW Radio 50,000 Watts, New York, uh, the station of William B. Williams, Ella Fitzgerald, Peggy Lee, Tony Bennett, Nat King Cole, and uh, Frank Sinatra. And uh, how I got there, uh, I went to a political function. Uh, I was covering it as a reporter. And um, John Lindsay walked in, the former mayor of New York City, and said, I like you, I want to tell you something. And he told me he was running for Senate for the state of New York uh, in 1980. He never did make it there, but um, that allowed me to get on WNEW. Henry Marcotte called me and said, hey, we want you to do that story for us. I said, how much are you going to pay me? He said, 10 bucks. I said, sold. And I was at WNEW for three and a half years. Uh, I do a talk called The Early Days of Radio, and The Early Days of TV seemed like a natural sequel to that. Early Days of TV. My favorite television program was this, The Test Pattern. Most people today of certain under the age of 60 have no idea what The Test Pattern was. But when you uh, put on the TV back in the day, um, you would see a test pattern when it's the day started out, it would be snow, then the test pattern, and then the national anthem, and then there would be the programming, and it was reverse at night, the programming, national anthem, the test pattern faded into snow. I knew I had it made when I saw the test pattern late at night, because I beat my parents to bed, even though I was four years old. Uh, you don't see that anymore. TV is commercial TV anyways, 93 years old. It started up in Schenectady at the General Electric facility. Uh, it was WRGB-TV, which was known as W2XB. Today it's WGY Television, and it is the oldest continuous, well, not oldest continuous, but the oldest TV station on and off until the 1940s. Uh, oh, years ago, in the mid 1980s, my reporter, my background is as a reporter, and I covered a lot of sports back in the 1980s. And uh, there would be boxing announcements, and boxing news conferences at Gallagher's on Eighth Avenue and 52nd Street in Manhattan. And how it go, Sell was part of that deal. I would see him a lot. I was acquaintances with Howard. I'm friendly with his three grand, three of his grandsons, uh, Colin, who is the New York Mets public address announcer. Uh, Colin Cosell, Justin Cosell, who is a uh, school principal, charter school principal in Connecticut, and Jared Kahana, who is an ESPN lawyer. And Cosell and I meet, um, not that we planned to meet, but we were together at um, Gallagher's. And um, Cosell and I are just talking, it's noon, and um, they're letting people in. And, and you, to get, before you got into Gallagher's, you were in this little waiting area. And that's where Howard was. That's where I was while we're talking to each other. Well, he was talking to me, I should say. Uh, I didn't get a, too many words in edgewise. And he says, you know, when they write about the history of TV, they're going to write about the three C's, Cronkite, Gosell, and Kotsin. And not necessarily in that order. So the seeds of this talk may have been planted into me by Howard Cosell. And if you think about what he was saying, uh, he was talking about the period of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Not quite early TV. He started in early TV in the 1950s. Cronkite was around early TV in the 1950s. Carson was around TV in the 1950s. But what Howard was attempting to say about the three C's, uh, Walter Cronkite, here you see him becoming the most trusted man in America. 
uh, the Kennedy assassination, November 2nd, 1963. Uh, Walter Un Old Iron Pants, that's, that was his nickname, Old Iron Pants, takes down the glasses, kind of sheds a tear, composes himself after he announces that John F. Kennedy is dead. Kennedy had been assassinated. And uh, puts the glasses back on and Old Iron Pants is back in the saddle. With that, he becomes the most trusted man in America. That's Howard. Howard Cosell was both the most popular and least popular man on TV at the same time in 1974. Howard Cosell. And there's Johnny. Johnny lasted 30 years with The Tonight Show. Um, that's about 17, 18 different lifetimes. Um, he was uh, started in 1962. Ended in 1992, Bette Midler was his last guest. And one of the things that Cosell probably was right about was these guys were originals on TV. Cronkite, the anchor man. Carson, the late night man, who a lot of people saw while they were in bed. And Cosell, and he was one of the reasons people tuned in to Monday Night Football in the 1970s. The beginnings of Vladimir Cosma. So Warkin invented the iconoscope, which was a tube that allowed you to uh, throw signals or, or, or waves through it for a television transmission. It was in the Westinghouse Laboratories back in 1923, where he was working in Pittsburgh. Philo Farnsworth was busy trying to get a television picture transmission, and he does by 1927. Um, his television image consisted of 60 horizontal lines. Uh, for those of us of a certain age, we remember those horizontal lines that used to roll and roll and roll and roll and roll. And you used to play with the, the knob, the horizontal control to see, it's called the horizontal control, to see if you can control the rolling. TV was difficult for us way back when, when we started out back in the Stone Ages when TV started. You got a TV. Uh, it was there, you had to turn the switch on, and the TV took a while to warm up. Then you finally got a picture. Well, you get a picture, it's rolling, and it has snow. And so you got to fix the rolling, and then you got to play with the rabbit ears, and then you might end up in a position like that, because that's the perfect position that you got with the rabbit ears to pull in the signal. And if somebody else was in the room and you were watching TV with them, they would say, don't move. It's good. It's good. It's good. That's it. Don't move. Don't you dare move. It's good. Um, occasionally, the antennas would break, and so you would need a wire hanger to put in the hole. Uh, the dial would break, so you would need long nose pliers to change the channel. And you had to get up all the time to change the channel or lower the sound. We didn't have one of these back then. So easy now. That's all you do. All you do is that now. We worked hard to watch TV back in the 50s and 60s. The first regular television service started in Germany, in Berlin, March 22nd, 1935, to coincide with the 1936 Olympics in Berlin and also in Munich, the Winter Olympics. And it was a little different from uh, Farnsworth's TV. This was a 180 line system. Uh, it was on the air for 90 minutes, three times a week, and it was supposed to be used for the Olympics and for propaganda purposes. Uh, that guy in the middle there, Jesse Owens, kind of ruined it for Adolf Hitler. Um, the, what was supposed to happen, at least in Hitler's mind, was that the Aryan society was going to excel and win as many gold and silver and bronze medals as possible, and this guy, Jesse Owens, upended uh, Adolf Hitler. But if you happen to be in Germany uh, and you wanted to watch the Olympics, uh, you could. There were uh, broadcasts up to eight hours a day, uh, and you could see um, the television or the transmission in Berlin and Hamburg. Ultimately, it died simply because not very, very many people bought televisions, and the Nazis decided it wasn't worth the effort, and they concentrated on other areas that they felt they could count, conquer. The 1939 World Series, World Series, World's Fair. Uh, I was uh, in Long Island, uh, on Long Island, a couple of years ago, uh, actually before the pandemic. And I was at a, a senior residence, and there was this guy, and he was in his 90s. 
and uh, he sees this picture. He looks at the picture and says, hey, wait a minute. He said, I want to say something. He said, go ahead. He said, I was there. So what do you mean? Said, yeah, I was in that pavilion. That was where they had television. I was there with my parents. I was about 12, 13 years old at the time. And um, they said to me, and this guy was in his mid-90s, sharp as a tech, at least for that. And they said to me, um, can we get you to go on TV? And he said, I didn't know what they were talking about. But um, his parents, they said to his parents, we want to put him on TV so you could see him right in the middle there on the screen. And they said yes, and they took him to a back room, and he was on TV, delighted his parents. His parents were as happy as could be. Uh, he never saw himself on TV, but uh, he remembered that people walked in and saw that thing right in the middle there, and they were gawking at it, and they were looking at it. It was like something out of this world, he said. Uh, what television will mean to you if you were in uh, Flushing, uh, in that pavilion in 1939 or 1940, RCA handed out this flyer saying what television will mean to you. I don't think television reached up uh, to where you are in Dutchess County. Uh, it went 50 miles north, 50 miles south, 50 miles west, 50 miles east. Uh, and uh, the signal came off the Empire State Building and some of the things that you might have seen or could have seen or what they were pitching you to see was the Metropolitan Opera or boxing, an award show, a baseball game, uh, a, a politician giving a talk. And they thought, well, you know what? You're never ever gonna have to leave your living room if you buy a TV. All the entertainment you want will be there. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, you probably have are familiar with uh, that place up there, Hyde Park. Uh, about three and a half years ago, my wife and I went up to Hyde Park. Uh, Franklin and Eleanor were really nice hosts, really, really nice hosts. They gave us some books to read, but they were a little stiff, so were the books, but they were still nice, nice hosts. And I went up there ostensibly to um, ask three questions. Uh, one, why did um, you, President Roosevelt, allow uh, the American team to compete in the uh, 1936 Berlin Olympics, which uh, uh, legitima legitimized the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler. Uh, two, you were the first one on TV. What was that like? And three, you allowed baseball to play after D uh, Pearl Harbor Day in 1941. Why? I got uh, answers to all three. But for this talk, uh, it was, well, Roosevelt was experienced in dealing with the media. He had fireside chats. He knew how to speak. And he appeared at the opening ceremony of the 39 World's Fair and became the first president of the United States to give a speech that was broadcast on TV. By the way, if you wanted to buy a TV, there were only 400 uh, when Roosevelt was first on, it sold in the New York City area. Eventually, uh, 1940 or so, you could get an RCA or General Electric or Dumont. Um, they range from um, five inches, uh, which is approximately the size of this, uh, to 12 inches. Uh, Dumont had a 14 and 16 inch model. Prices started at 200 bucks, as high as a thousand. Right now, that would be 1600 to 8,000 dollars. The first baseball game that was uh, done in Upper Manhattan, Baker Bowl, Columbia and Princeton, May 17th, 1939. Walt Disney was in on the ground floor of TV, both in England and the United States. In England, uh, there was a uh, Mickey Mouse cartoon available, but no such luck here. If you were one of the kids that were sitting around and you were lucky enough to have TV, you heard, hey, Disney is going to have a cartoon on. We're going to be able to see a cartoon. So you probably said, oh, maybe it's Mickey, maybe it's Donald, maybe it's Donald and Daisy, or Mickey and Minnie, or Pluto, or Goofy. Maybe it's one of those, but you ended up with him. Gus Goose, my cousin Gus, Donald's cousin Gus, is a slob. He was not a likable cartoon character. In fact, uh, he hasn't really been seen very much except for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which might be in the library. On May 19th, Donald's cousin Gus, someone want to explain to me how a duck and a goose could be cousins, because I can't figure out how that happened, but that happened. Anyway, Donald's cousin Gus airs on the NBC experimental station 2X, W2XBS, later WNBC-TV Channel 4 in New York. It was Channel 1. 
Uh, and it was the first time a movie cartoon was ever televised in the United States. First baseball game was between the Brooklyn Dodgers, Cincinnati Reds, Major League Baseball game, August 26, 1939. Still about 400 TVs in the New York City area could watch that game. Uh, that's the cover of my ebook, America's Passion, How a Coal Miner's Game Became the NFL in the 20th Century. And the only reason I have it up there is that that's Benny Feathers, who looks like there's some unnecessary roughness in dragging him down. Look where the fist is. That might have hurt. Uh, but he was a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers, and the Brooklyn Dodgers National Football League team was uh, the first, uh, was, they were part of the first game, first two teams ever uh, on uh, TV, NFL with the uh, Dodgers taking on the Philadelphia Eagles, and there were about a 1,000 television sets by then. Uh, both CBS and NBC started before World War II. The war would delay TV's progress. It was a temporary delay. When the GIs returned home, television would grow quickly. In 1940, the Metropolitan Opera broadcast. Uh, that was the first time it was on NBC 81 years later. It's still on TV, but not on NBC, on PBS. And uh, Color TV, the anniversary of Color TV is August 29th, 1940. Uh, Peter Carl Goldmark of CBS announced his invention of the color television system. The odd thing is about CBS, they invented it, but it was NBC that introduced it in 1955. If you like commercials, this is for you, the first ever TV commercial, was before a Brooklyn Dodgers Philadelphia Phillies game, July 1st, 1940. And how was that commercial shot? Well, simple. Uh, they took uh, the Indian head uh, test pattern, they knocked out the Indian head, and instead put NBC RCA in there, and then Bullock, Bulliver watches. Bulliver was a sponsor for 14 bucks, so you have a clock from 12 to 11, and you got three hands. You got the minute hand, uh, the hour hand, and the sweeping seconds uh, hand, and you shot that, you put a camera to it, and voila, you had your first commercial. Channel One, July 1st, 1940, at 2.29 in the afternoon, and the Boulevard logo is, pro is prominently displayed. Uh, this is the animation that happened about 10, 12 years later. Boulevard, watch time. Uh, on November 7th, 19, rather December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day, Ray Forrest of WNBT broadcasts a news report concerning the Pearl Harbor attack uh, that ended the programming that they were showing, which was between, uh, which was the New York Rangers hockey game. Channel 2 had come online in New York, WCBW, they broadcast a special that evening from the Grand Central Terminal Studios, which are still there. Not really used, but they are still there. Uh, the U.S. War Production Board halted the manufacture of television and radio equipment for consumer use on April 1st, 1942. That ban is lifted in 1945. Um, Jackie Gleason, now we talk about the shows, the Jackie Gleason show. Some of you might remember Jackie Gleason from CBS, but he was not originally a CBS um, program producer. He started on the Dumont Network, and the Dumont Network is long forgotten. However, uh, in the 66 years that it is gone, uh, it should be remembered for being cutting edge TV because it really was. It was the world's pioneer commercial television network. They beat out David Sornoff's NBC and Bill Paley's CBS for the distinction of being number one, a start operation in operations in 1946 uh, on September 15th and by October 2nd, the first program. Uh, that they have on is a television soap opera, first television soap opera, something called Fairway Hill on Dumont. Uh, some of the shows that were on the early days of TV that originated on Dumont included Ted Mack's original Amateur Hour, which began on radio in the 1930s, Major Bose, the Maury Amsterdam show, Captain Video and his Video Rangers. I've done this talk at uh, senior homes, uh, both in Connecticut, New Jersey, Obviously, two people wouldn't know each other, and they both had similar stories. There was a woman in Stanford who said that uh, her father bought her the Captain Video space helmet, and she sat and watched Captain Video with the space helmet on. And uh, this guy in New Jersey told me, he said, I don't know who bought me the helmet, 
but I had the helmet, and they were both kids at the time because you're talking nearly 70 years ago. Um, and um, they had, I had the helmet on, and I watched the show as well. And also the Arthur Murray dance party. Uh, there's an Arthur Murray that uh, is opening up about three miles north of me on Route 22 over uh, in Tuckahoe, supposedly opening up. Um, but COVID's been in the way. You can always tell Arthur Murray uh, dance students when I speak a lot on cruise ships and uh, they always come out and they always introduce themselves and they always have all the moves and everything else and they look um, they you know who they are you know who they are just looking at them this is Ernie Kovacs Ernie Kovacs was a comedy innovator in the early days of TV in fact uh, some of what you still see today in comedy skits though there aren't very many comedy skits except for Saturday Night Live now um, originated back in 1949 with Kovacs, who was on a local station in Philadelphia, and he was picked up by the Dumont Network. Uh, uh, he There was a lot of quick in and outs. He used a lot of uh, editing, and uh, some of the uh, shows survived only because his wife, Edie Adams, uh, purchased the videotapes that ABC, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and ABC was about ready to destroy. <coughs> Um, uh, because networks didn't keep tapes. They just, over and over and over and over again, they just recorded on it, but she rescued them. And if you're a Kovacs fan, and I am a Kovacs fan, uh, occasionally you'll see it on PBS, and there's a lot of stuff up on YouTube as well. And she saved it. Uh, a lot of shows disappeared unless they were filmed. In the early days of TV, uh, there weren't network affiliates per se, uh, t local TV stations that were lined up with uh, networks. Uh, so if you uh, were looking and you could cherry pick outside of New York or, or Washington, Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, you could pretty much cherry pick what you want because they were uh, owned and operated stations by the networks in those cities. Um, so if you look and CBS is offering you The Lucy Show or Jack Benny or Ed Sullivan, um, and you look and NBC is offering Milton Berle and Sid Caesar, chances are, chances are great that you're going to go with the established names and not unknowns like Jackie Gleason or Ernie Kovacs. Uh, and Dumont could offer you a Jackie Gleason or a Bishop Fulton J. Sheehan, but um, you might want to go with a known commodity like Bob Hope. Dumont was the first TV network to do a nightly news program from Washington, D.C., the nation's window on the world. Uh, they were also the first television network that scheduled the children's show regularly, The Small Fry, with Big Brother, <coughs> excuse me, Big Brother Bob Emmerich. And that was introduced into the daytime schedule back in 1946, long before. Uh, Buffalo Bob Smith and Howdy Doody, and Ralph Cramden, Jackie Gleason. Uh, the first time he threatened to send his wife Alice Cramden to the moon was on the Cavalcade of Stars. One of these days, Alice, one of these days, Alice, bang, zoom to the moon. Um, that was on the Dumont Network. Of course, you couldn't do a skit like that today because it would be alleged, you know, verbal assault. But uh, take a look at her. It's like, no, 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 no. You're not going to do that. You're not going to do that at all. By the way, the original uh, uh, Alice was a woman by the name of Pearl Kelton, who was uh, blacklisted because it was thought that she was a communist. And um, the way Jackie Gleason got around saying that she was no longer on the show, she was hospitalized. She would come back in the 1960s and be part of the uh, Gleason Ensemble in Miami Beach. He didn't want to get rid of her. Uh, I'll talk more about uh, blacklisting in a few minutes. So it was on the uh, Cavalcade of Stars that Ralph Cramden first threatened to send Alice to the moon. Dumont was the home to the first network soap opera, the first network newscast originating in Washington. The, well, let me get Howard Cosell to do this. Hey, Rune, get over here. They want you to talk to them. Rune Arlich, who put together Monday Night Football. Rune was part of the primetime telecast on Dumont of the National Football League, Saturday Night Football back in the early 1950s. That's where Rune Arlich cut his teeth. 
He would go on to ABC, uh, running sports, the wide world of sports, the Olympics, Monday Night Football, and then would be the head of NBC, ABC News and would hire Barbara Walters as the first woman co-host of a network newscast that was in the mid-1970s. So Dumont had Jackie Gleason before CBS, Bishop Sheen before ABC, the original Amateur Hour before NBC, had some programming, but um, they are now primarily remembered as a purveyor of low-budget programming, which is not fair. And I'll tell you why it's not fair, because most programming back in the 1950s, which was live, was low-budget programming, with the exception of the I Love Lucy show, which was shot on film, um, and some other shows that were done on the Desi Lou lot. Um, Dumont put out a good product, television-wise. Uh, unfortunately, when Dumont folded, and it folded in 1953, uh, 1955, September 23rd, 1955, with a quiz show called What's the Story?, uh, there were a lot of people who uh, were owed money, I guess, and, uh, and claimed rights to uh, videos, which were kinescopes. You took a video camera and you just shot the TV. And that's how those programs were preserved uh, in the uh, 1950s. And uh, anyway, um, there were fights over who owned the kinescope, who owned this, who owned that. Then a lawyer one day decided he had enough of the fights. And, and this is a real crime, what he did, and the lawyer was never charged with anything. He rented a, a truck, and they went up to the Bronx, where all the kinescopes were stored, and he loaded up the truck with all the kinescopes, which were all the old Dumont shows, threw them in the truck, drove to the East River, dumped it into the East River. There are some Dumont shows that have survived, not very many of them, but there are some that you can go up on YouTube, Shows aren't very good uh, that survived. Um, there were probably better shows. I've watched some of those shows, but it was in keeping with what was going on in those days. Most television shows weren't very good back in the 1950s. Uh, and Dumont's out of business by September 23rd. There were 44,000 television sets in use in the United States in 1947. I have a friend by the name of Bob Block. Bob Block is the uh, father of pay TV in the United States with the Mo uh, Wemeco Home Theater that uh, was introduced in 1972 in the New York area on uh, Channel 68 in Newark, New Jersey, and Channel 67 out in Smithtown, Long Island. Uh, the Wemeco Home Theater was what it was. You could watch movies on that. Uh, but anyway, Bob uh, in the 1950s uh, was both an advertising executive and also owned a comedy club. Two of his uh, clients back in the 1950s, uh, uh, an obscure little grocery store in Milwaukee by the name of Kohl's, K-O-H-L-S, Kohl's. You probably know them better as a clothing slash department store now. And the other was uh, Selig, uh, Selig Ford. Uh, Bud Selig was the baseball commissioner. His father owned an uh, automobile dealership in Milwaukee, and Bob, uh, the, those were two of his clients. As far as the comedy club went, uh, his two best friends were uh, Henny Youngman, who you might remember or might not, the king of the one-liners, and also Maury Amsterdam, whose uh, Buddy Sorrell character on the Dick Van Dyke show, which started in 1960, was based on Mel Brooks uh, as part of the writing team for your show of shows. Uh, with Sid Caesar and Imogen Coca in the 1950s. Uh, anyway, Henny Youngman uh, is faced with a dilemma here. Um, NBC is moving the Texaco Star Theater from television, uh, from radio to television, and they're looking for hosts, except um, uh, Henny also, who was born in England, also the same night that he's supposed to get a tryout, has to do or is contracted to do a royal performance before uh, Princess Elizabeth and others in London. And he has to make a decision whether he's going to do that or that. Uh, I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, the, first, uh, the first host to meet the press, and the only woman host to meet the press, Martha Roundtree. Uh, she has an ashtray there, too. Uh, she uh, came up with the idea of Meet the Press in 1943 on the Mutual Radio Network, where I once worked, out of business now. Uh, and she moves it over to TV on November 6, 1947, going to NBC. It's the longest-running show on American TV. Uh, it is 73 years old. 
she was the only woman host. Uh, eventually, she bought the time. And eventually, she brings in a partner, Lauren Spivak, who would buy her out. And she would end up on Dumont doing the same type of show. Uh, so she created and hosted Meet the Press. Lauren Spivak joined later. Uh, it's Ed. Oh, 631. 631. Ed Sullivan, Ed used to do all these gyrations. Why did he do all these gyrations? Well, one, he wants to see what time it was to make sure the X went on. Uh, my cousin it was, is Jerry Stiller. Stiller and Mirror were on about 36 times. And uh, he told me one day about uh, all the gyrations and everything else. And uh, he had a story about when he was on the show once. Uh, and Ed had something for everybody, for kids, Tokyo Gigio, for teenagers, the Beatles, for young adults, you know, Steve Lawrence and uh, Edie Gourmet for a little older adults, uh, Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett, those people, and then Jimmy Durante for the seniors. Um, so um, he also had people on from Broadway because Broadway was dark on Sunday nights. So Jerry's telling me the story once about Anna Marie Alberghetti, who was in a Broadway play. And um, so Ed has her sing a song from whatever play that she's in, and she's not getting much of an applause. And they'd say, come on, come on, let's hear it, let's hear it. And, and, and the applause is better, but it's, uh, come on, let's hear it. Come on, let's hear it, let's hear it, let's hear it. Let's hear it for Ava Maria. It's much better in person. It's much better in person. You usually, usually have a good laugh at that. It's much better in person. Uh, oh, so back to Henny Youngman. Texaco Star Theater, that's me uh, in uh, Dearborn, Michigan at the Henry Ford Museum. And so uh, Henny's got this choice to make. Uh, do you uh, go on the show or do you do the Royal Command performance? Henny ultimately chooses London. Milton Berle gets the guest spot. And there he is, Uncle Milty, Mr. Television. He's a smash hit, a smash hit. And uh, I know a guy, Larry Strickland, just uh, celebrated his 80th birthday who was one of the kids on the Milton Berle show, which went from 1948 to 1956. And uh, he never knew the story about Henny Youngman. And Henny died a bitter man thinking he should have been Mr. Television. Never knew the story about him. And uh, he said, you know, that's crazy. He said, Henny Youngman would have been a disaster uh, hosting that show. He said, Milton could do an awful lot of things. He was a, perf a perfectionist as well. Uh, had a photographic memory and uh, knew exactly what he wanted. Burl and Youngman were also old rivals, old friends from the vaudeville burlesque stage. But he became Mr. Television. He sold a lot of television sets, allegedly. Uh, 44,000 uh, when uh, the idea comes about, let's put Texaco Star Theater on TV. Uh, he gets on 1948. It's up to 500,000 when he leaves 80, 30 million TVs are in use. Not all of them because of Burl. I mean, there were stations that were being added and added and added. Uh, eventually, NBC would have 71 stations because, or 71 affiliates because of Burl. Now, television, I'm doing it the same talk on uh, Friday afternoon in Vermilion, South Dakota. And uh, for that, all of this stuff that I'm talking about they never saw. They didn't get TV in Vermilion or in South Dakota until about 1954, 1955. The Texaco Star Theater, highest rated show of the 5051 television season, the first year the Nielsen ratings used. Uh, also in 1950, Ed Sullivan would get some competition from NBC, and it should have been on paper pretty good. It was called the Colgate Comedy Hour, and it was regularly, well, let's, let's see who the regular hosts were. Joe Franklin's favorite performer, Eddie Cantor. Uh, he was in New York for 20 minutes. And then you had uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis hosting the Los Angeles uh, part of the show. And uh, you had a very, 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 at this point, overexposed Abbott and Costello with the Who's on First at Niagara Falls and all the movies that they were still doing radio. And uh, they had a syndicated TV show called Abbott and Costello, which Costello paid for and, and put on. 
Um, and so the show didn't do well. Eddie Cantor was a big star in the 1920s. This is now more than 20, 25 years later. Abbott and Costello to totally overexposed. Lewis and Martin are starting to go that way uh, in their height of popularity. They had been around for a while. They used to draw Beatles like crowds um, to see them at the Paramount uh, Theater uh, and used to wave out of the hotels in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, Sullivan in the end would beat them. But this show is very important in television history to this day uh, because this show, uh, AT&T started a coast-to-coast -coast coaxial, and I don't have any coaxial cable in front of me. Oh, yeah, I do. Um, the coaxial cable here. Um, here you go, some coaxial cable. You have it all through your house today. You can't live without coaxial cable. Uh, coaxial cable, microwave uh, interconnection, which allowed uh, the telecast from the three areas uh, across the country. About three years ago, I was in Ten uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, doing this talk at a senior home. And there was this guy who was a retired engineer who tried to explain to me how this all worked. And I said, hey, I'm talent. I'm talent. I'm the last to know and the first to go. And he laughed. He said, you got that right. The show did have talent, but in the end, Ed Sullivan did beat them out. Howdy doody. Howdy doody was the first color television show aimed at kids. Color TV really starts in earnest on WMAQ, actually known as WNDQ in Chicago uh, in the mid-1950s. Channel 5 there when the switches flipped and a lot of NBC programming went into color. Uh, How they do these started December 27, 1947 and would last until 1960. First TV show uh, for children in color, although some parents came up with this uh, green screen idea and put it across their TV and there would be some reflection off of there that looked like some sort of color, but it really wasn't. It was just the screen that you put on the TV that you got for like 29 cents. Uh, the reason why this was on in color, Buffalo Bob and the Healthy Duty, well, simple. RCA, Radio Corporation of America, was NBC's parent company. They made televisions. And you could get the kids to say, I want a TV, I want a TV, I want a TV, I want a TV. Nag, 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 nag. I don't know how successful it was, but NBC tried it. Uh, initially, it was on daily at 5 o'clock Eastern Time, New York Time. And Captain Kangaroo. Bob Keeshan was Clarabelle the Clown uh, on that show. Now, these people are watching TV, and these people, I, I'm not sure, you know, I just found this picture and there's no caption to the picture, but it looks like it's October, November, baseball, the fall classic, World Series, games played every day in the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, they may be watching, um, a baseball game based on the way they're dressed, um, or maybe a football game on the weekend, college game, pro game. There's a woman back there that doesn't really care. People used to watch TV like that. Uh, they would go to a storefront, an appliance store, walk in front, watch TV. You wouldn't have sound on. You couldn't hear it outside, but if you came in, the salesman would put the sound up, maybe you're interested in TV. So they use TV as a lure for you to come into the appliance store. And that may be how cable TV started. Whoops, let me fix the, adjust the, here, the vertical control. Yeah, okay, we got it. So it's claimed that the first television, cable television system, uh, was created in 1948 in Mahoney City, Pennsylvania. Um, there was a uh, Stone Mountain, and Mahoney City was north of Philadelphia, and there was Channel 3, Channel 6, and Channel 10, and the signal was blocked by Stone Mountain. So Mahoney, rather, uh, Walson owns a appliance store, and he's trying to sell TVs, and he's trying to sell TVs, and you can't see, you know, the reception is poor. You can't sell something that you can't see well. So he decides, well, you know what? Let me do something here. There is John Walson. Yeah, do something here. I'm going to erect an antenna tower on top of Stone Mountain, and I'm going to take my customers up there. I'm going to get you know, whatever electricity or whatever they have up there. I'm going to take my customers to that location, and I'm going to find electricity and plug in my receivers. This was 1947. So he goes uh, to the Army Navy store. Uh, or the Army surplus story, buy some heavy-duty twin-lead Army surplus wire, 
He runs the wire from trees from the mountain down the trees to his appliance store. And voila, he's got a picture. He has a picture. And uh, he convinces some people to buy televisions and he runs the wires into the house. And uh, this thing is called community antenna system. Oddly enough, his area didn't get wired for cable until around 1960. So there were very few people who actually uh, were there for community antenna television, which is what it was called. Now, the other story is also 1948. And that's me. That's a story of Oregon in July of uh, 19, uh, rather 2018. Um, I was um, there, um, Astoria is at the end of the Columbia River and the Pacific Ocean, and I was there because my daughter decided she lives in Seattle. We had never really got through Oregon. She says, let's go through Oregon. I said, okay. So we get to Astoria, and I had no idea about this, but there's a little train that goes one and three quarter miles along the R Columbia River waterfront. And I thought, yeah, it's free, it's cool, let's do this. You know, it's a cool little thing. And uh, the guy who's conducting on the train, it's only two cars, uh, and they were, uh, yeah, they were rescued cars, so to speak, and uh, local volunteers uh, restored them. And uh, anyway, he says, well, now we're passing the place where cable TV started in the United States. And I say, hey, wait a minute. My friend Frank Carney, who's now in North Carolina, used to work for John Wilson in the 1980s. He said it started in Poconos. And he tells the story. And the story is the other story about the star of the cable TV. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Ed Parsons. And that's his office where the woman or the man in red, I guess it's uh, the uh, somebody in red, and uh, the other one in that khaki type um, uh, coat. And by the way, this is the middle of July in the story. It never gets above 62 degrees. It is a marine climate, so you only see the sun about two hours a day. So that's why I am dressed like that in the middle of uh, July. Anyway, so uh, Ed Parsons has his radio station in that building and his tower is behind him at the highest place in, in uh, the area, the hotel, behind the hotel in that office building. And so he knows a little bit about how radio signals work. Um, well, let's back up a little bit to find out why Ed Parsons is in this predicament. Uh, he goes to Chicago in 1946 at a radio uh, convention, and it's in Chicago, and he brings his wife Grace with him, and there's a demonstration of WKBK-TV, Channel 2, uh, at, at the radio um, convention. And Ed's got his wife Grace there, and she looks and says, I want TV, I want TV, I want TV, I want TV. Well, there are no TVs. There are no TVs, no TV stations. Uh, in the Pacific Northwest. But finally, uh, there is a station that comes out in Seattle in 1948, KRSC TV. And uh, Ed gets a television, hauls it down to his office, and decides he's going to make Grace happy. And he's going to play around. He gets some coaxial cable, and he hooks it into the back of the TV to his antenna. And they're moving the antenna around and all that. And he gets a signal. He gets a signal calls up Grace. Grace is great, great, great. I can watch TV. Great. I can watch TV. Well, Grace happens to tell the TV goes to the house. Grace happens to tell everybody in the neighborhood, we got a TV. And Ed has a problem. He loses his kitchen, loses his dining room, loses his living room, loses his bathroom. And he's got to figure out how to get all these people out of his house because Grace has told everybody, let's watch TV. Okay, how do we get out of the house? Well, he does. He uh, decides to get a second TV. He runs the cable down to the second TV. He splits the TV signal. Cool, I could do it too. And then he goes, tells everybody, go buy a TV. And I guarantee you, you'll get TV. And he does. Charges $3 a month and everybody has TV. But he owns a radio station, and if he tells this to the Federal Communications Commission, his radio license may be yanked. So he tells everybody, keep it quiet, because really what he's doing is stealing a TV signal from Seattle. Keep it quiet, keep it quiet. Well, they do keep it quiet. And he's um, got like 14, 18 customers uh, initially, $3 a month, $72 in his pocket. Nobody knows about it. 
and everybody's got TV from Seattle in Astoria. 1948, CBS Television News debuts with Douglas Edwards. It's the second longest TV show in American history that's still going. Uh, political uh, convention from Philadelphia, the networks, uh, NBC and CBS cover that, and Dumont. Uh, July 29th, the BBC starts service of the 1948 uh, Summer Olympics, broadcasting the opening ceremony. I am going to be doing a talk that uh, has been assigned to me, mainly because of this picture, about uh, I Love Lucy and how Lucille Ball went from a cigarette model to being rejected by talent agents into a Three Stooges short where she learned how to take seltzer up her nose and a uh, pie in the face, to the Marx Brothers, to B-movies, to marrying Desi, uh, to almost divorcing Desi, to having her movie career end at the age of 34, and going on radio and having a hit radio show that they want transferred to TV, and how Lucy and Desi became the first interracial couple on television, to Lucy being outed as a communist, to the divorce, to her becoming the most powerful woman TV executive in Hollywood, studio executive. Uh, I'm going to spare you that talk. I haven't even written it yet. Those are the, the mileposts that I'm going to use. But anyway, Desi Lou production starts in 1950. Uh, Lucy and Desi barnstorm the country, do a cornball act with a uh, Cuban uh, comedian uh, to show CBS, hey, we could do this. And the show starts in 1951. CBS wanted a proper man as Lucy's husband. Uh, Jack Benny goes to TV in 1950. I loved him on radio. TV, he's 56 years old. And all of that illusion that he built up, the blue eyes, green with envy, all that other stuff goes out the window because you could see him, whereas radio is a theater of the imagination. Some of the Benny stuff is funny, but most of it is looking at a guy 56 and older who doesn't quite have the energy that uh, you could fake on radio, but he made the transition to TV. He was on for about 14 years uh, on and off, and he said he'd rather do TV than radio. TV is where it's at, but he really was good on radio. He was okay on TV. He was great on radio. Hey, there's Groucho, the one, the only Groucho Marx with Fenneman. George Fenneman has his announcer. You bet your life started on radio, ended up on TV. This is a story that floats around that may have happened, may not have happened, may have been on television. No, it wasn't on TV. It was probably on the radio. It was, might have been on the radio show, KGO in San Francisco, the You Bet Your Life uh, show. Anyway, uh, Fenneman is the announcer, and he introduces Marion and Charlotte's story. And he says, Groucho Marx, meet Marion and Charlotte's story. They have 20 children. And when Groucho uh, says to the couple, well, uh, particularly Marion, well, why have you chosen to raise such a large family? Mrs. Story allegedly says, I love my husband, to which the allegation is out there that Groucho responded, I love my cigar, but take it out of my mouth every once in a while. It's in Tarrytown giving a talk, and there's a married couple sitting there listening to me doing this. And I see the woman going like that to her husband. What's he mean by that? What's he mean by that? What's he mean by that? And the husband said, after all these years, I still have to tell you these things. But anyway, this may or may not happen. Groucho said it happened. Then he said it didn't. Then he said he did. Uh, there's no uh, evidence that it happened other than hearsay and Groucho saying, yeah, it may have happened. Uh, I Love Lucy was uh, one of the top shows of the era. Uh, also, there was uh, The Tonight Show. Sigourney Weaver's father, Pat Weaver, Sylvester Weaver, Sylvester Pat Weaver, advertising guy, came up with the idea of a late night show. And the late night show uh, would be the template for what you see today, whether it's Fallon, whether it's Kimmel, whether it's Gobert or Conan O'Brien, or before that, Leatherman and Johnny, of course, uh, and before him is Jack Barr and Steve Allen. Jerry Lester, Maury Amsterdam are the hosts. Maury left the show, leaving uh, Jerry Lester with a new kind of sidekick named Jenny Lewis or Dagmar. And about three years ago, I was in Glen Cove, New York. There was a guy in his 90s, senior home. And I hear him pant all of a sudden. <gasps> I said, what's wrong? What's wrong? Should I get to it? No, no, no. So well, what's the matter? And he says, 
Dagmar, she was the best breather on TV. And I looked at her and I said, man, you should be ashamed of yourself, shouldn't you? Uh, there was another guy too who did the same thing uh, on Long Island. He went like that. And I said, how old are you? He said, 93. I said, does your mother know you're still doing that? And he laughed. Um, hey, 90 year old guy still having in him for them. That is Dagmar. Dagmar was the uh, Kim Kardashian of her era. She had two assets. She went from $75 a week to $1,250 a week. And all she had to do was show up with her two assets and kind of sing a song. But that was basically it. Uh, the show lasted about two years, but Dagmar's uh, endurance continued in the 1950s. There's a coup de ville. Um, Chevrolet, Cadillac, General Motors uh, cars had, uh, take a look at the bumper there, take a look at that bumper, uh, in that bumper. Um, they were called the Dagmar bumpers after Dagmar because some engineer thought, hey, let's stick the Dagmar bumpers there. <laughs> it's there. Well, car, you know, the car fanatics know about the Dagmar bumpers. So uh, that was her lasting impression on some engineer at General Motors to stick the Dagmar bumpers on Coudeville and other Chevy and GM cars. Bum, 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 bum. The story about C is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet was a popular show from radio to TV in the 1950s. It lasted eight years. It was enduring. Version two returned in 1967, this time in color. There was supposed to be a third version in the 1980s. But Jack Webb died from a heart attack, so it was never done. It had high ratings, a recognizable theme song. Stoller and Lieber uh, had uh, Joe Friday, Sergeant Joe Friday, and the song Searching with Charlie Chan and the Royal Canadian Mountain Police. Um, so uh, it was a big deal. And there he is, Jack Webb, Joe Friday. Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. The Today Show was also created by Pat Weaver. It started in 1952. And uh, for those of you who uh, watch the Today Show today, generally what you are seeing is the Today Show from uh, back in 1952, 69 years ago. It has not changed. Well, it has. It's changed hosts. And uh, the mascot, uh, J. Fred Muggs, still is alive and is down in Florida somewhere living the life of the contented chimpanzee. Uh, it started in 1952, blended national news headlines, interviews with newsmakers, lifestyle features, light news, gimmicks, local news updates from network stations, and local weather. Uh, it has not changed. It is still the same show it was. It just looks like it belongs in 2021 as opposed to 1952. Not much has changed. Uh, educational TV also started in 1954. Uh, and it lasted until October 4th, 1970. It was co-owned by the Ford Foundation and later by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. It was founded as the Educational Television and Radio Center by the University of Michigan in 1952. Uh, it would move to New York in 1958, and originally it was set up just to exchange uh, programs from local stations to other stations, and uh, it would be Fred Rogers who really would save uh, NET in the 1960s and got co congressional funding uh, when he went before Congress. Uh, the Romper Room Show uh, with Miss Joan in whatever market that is uh, out in Ohio at that point. Mr. Doobie, remember Mr. Doobie, bumper stopper, bumper boo, tell me, tell me, who are you? Um, and A Romper Room with Miss Joan. It was a children's series. It was franchised by uh, Burt Claster. Uh, it was syndicated from 1953 to 1994. I was never a real big fan of Doobie. I guess I watched it a little bit, and I remember the romper, bumper stomper boo thing, but it wasn't for me. And the program was created by Burt Claster, and his wife, uh, Nancy, was the presenter. Uh, each program uh, opened with a greeting from the local hostess. Uh, they were all local and the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the Tonight Show comes back as The Tonight Show with Steve Allen, with Don Knotts and Louis Nye and Tom Poston and Steve Allen and others. The Man in the Street featured Don Knotts as the nervous Mr. Morrison, maybe the prototype of Barney Fife. Tom Poston couldn't remember his name. 
Pat Harrington was an Italian golfer by the name of Guido Panisi. Louis Nye was the smug Gordon Hathaway. And Bill Dana, my name is Jose Jimenez. Bill Dana was a friend of, of, a friend of mine, late Shelley Saltman. Uh, they grew up together in the north end, northwest end of Boston with uh, Barbara Walters was there and Barry Morse and Leonard Bernstein and David Susskind all came out of that neighborhood. Uh, Elvis was on the Steve Allen show wearing a tux, singing to a basset hound. And guess what song he's singing? He ain't nothing but a hound dog. Elvis was not happy doing that. Jack Parr followed uh, Steve Allen and he got himself in trouble a joke about the WC, a water closet, a bathroom. That's how pure then that uh, TV was back in those days. He got suspended. If you were a married couple, even if you were Lucy and Desi, you had twin beds and uh, you had to uh, sit or, or you had to be in the separate beds. And if you sat on the bed, you had to have one foot on the floor, one foot on the bed. Uh, Mary Tyler Moore uh, went to war with CBS in 1960 to wear capri pants because she said housewives did not, um, they, they didn't in dress pants, uh, dress skirt, they didn't vacuum the house or wash the floor. The exception to the rule was Lucy. And the reason why Lucy and Desi owned the show, the networks didn't really have too much to do with the show. They owned the show, so she dressed the way she wanted. Uh, Dick Clark, there is Dick Clark, America's eternal teenager, American bandstand around the 1970s. On October 7th, 1952, WFIL Channel 6 in Philadelphia started a show called Bandstand. That lasted about four years. It became American Bandstand, and uh, the emphasis was changed from big bands to teens dancing to popular records. Dick, Ho Dick Clark became the host in 1956. The very weak ABC picked up the show in 1957. And I don't know if you saw that. I think they're bringing the dancers out. Well, maybe not. Oh! Oh, it's my wife. 1982. She's at Disneyland. I'm at Disneyland too. It's our honeymoon. And why would I take a picture of my wife at Disneyland in 1982? Why does that have anything to do with TV? Well, in 1954, ABC had just 14 affiliates. CBS had 74. NBC had 71. Dumont didn't have very many. They were in the same category as ABC. ABC was owned by Paramount, and it was a weak network. And Walt Disney is bouncing around Southern California, literally begging anybody he could find for money to build his dream, an amusement park 40 miles south of Los Angeles in the orange fields of orange groves of Anaheim. And he's striking out. He's going from place to place to place. But there's a guy at Paramount. He said, hey, wait a minute, Walt, wait before you leave. Before you leave, I got an idea. We'll put some money up for this thing you call Disneyland. And, uh, but you got to do two things for us. You got to give us two shows. Disney, the mouse that roared, the mouse th that built the house, Mickey Mouse. Uh, Disneyland was one of the shows. And the Mickey Mouse Club was the other one. And that helped ABC become very profitable. Eventually, ABC would invest some of that money into Westerns and detective series like Desi Lou's Untouchables with Robert Stack. Over at CBS, they had an interesting show that started at the end of the 1950s, 1959, called The Twilight Zone with Rod Serling who used storytelling to explore the human condition of his culture, the era between 1959 and 1964. This is my New York version of this. I don't show this in Chicago or Detroit or Vermilion, South Dakota or Denver or Boston. That's the late Sonny Fox. He just passed away a couple of months ago at the age of 95 from COVID. Uh, that was me and him about eight years ago up in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, he was one of uh, the Kinney Show hosts. There were uncle shows that survived uh, from the 1950s into the 1970s where the uncle tried to do a legitimate show and was always, it was always somebody, always somebody that disrupted uh, him, including me with Uncle Floyd back in 1978 on Channel 68 uh, in New Jersey. Uh, in New York, there was um, Sandy Becker, who did all kinds of characters. 
There was Joe Bolton, who, and he had uh, Sandy Becker had Warner Brothers cartoons. There was Joe Bolton, who had the Three Stooges show. Captain Jack McCarthy, Bolton and McCarthy on Channel 11 with the Popeye show. Chuck McCann, who was on both Channel 11 and Channel 5, and was Sonny Fox's long, long-term partner. Back. Thank you, Windows, for crashing. Uh, anyway, uh, Sid Caesar and Imogene Coker there. They uh, were of the show of shows, and you couldn't put together the show of shows anymore because uh, you couldn't get people like Mel Brooks, Neil Simon, Danny Simon, Mel Tonkin, Lucille Kaleman, uh, Selma Diamond, Joseph Stein, Michael Stewart, Tony Webster, Carl Reiner, Larry Gelbart, and Woody Allen all on the same writing staff. Uh, it was just too much. Now, King Cole, uh, first, is not the first African American to host the show. Hazel Scott did that. Billy Daniels did that. But he is the most prominent. And uh, his show lasted about a year and a half. Unfortunately for Nat King Cole, he never got a sponsor. Uh, he was a frequent guest on your show of shows. NBC wanted to save the show and move it from Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. Uh, but the Singer Sewing Machine Company wanted that time. And they wanted to move it to Saturday night over uh, at 7 o'clock. And Nat said no, the last show, which is up on uh, YouTube. Uh, December 17th, 1957, and it's a montage of photographs uh, with Nat King Cole featuring some of his guests, and he sings, The Party Is Over. Hazel Scott was the first African-American woman ever to host a show. She was on Dumont, and her career came tumbling to an end because she was outed as a communist, and she decided to go to the House on, on the uh, House. Committee on American Activities uh, to clear her name, uh, but all her sponsors uh, left, and then Dumont fired her. She ended up uh, over in uh, Europe. Um, there was some ethnicity in terms of uh, the early days of television. Uh, uh, my mama, I remember mama was about the Norwegian family. There was a show about an Italian family. Uh, Beulah, Queen of the Kitchen, played by both Ethel Waters and Hattie McDonald. Uh, it moved over from radio to TV. Unfortunately, it was on ABC and never got any uh, viewers, and that was the end of that show. But there was one show that featured African American actors as uh, the leads. It was the Amos and Andy show, which came over from uh, radio. And uh, Amos and Andy on radio were white actors, on television, African American actors, and that was a problem. Uh, the problem was the NAACP uh, decided that, oh, no, 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 this can't be. This can't be at all. Uh, we hate the characters. We hate the way they are. So uh, what happened uh, was uh, the uh, boycott was uh, in place. Blatt's Beer was the sponsor of the show. The show did rather well in its two seasons that, we were, that was on. But uh, Blatt's uh, bailed out of the... Um, business of sponsoring the Amos and Andy show because of the NAACP boycott. Uh, some of the women on TV in the 1950s, Dinah Shore, See the USA and your Chevrolet, Betty White on KNBH in Los Angeles, Eve Arden, our Miss Brooks, she can't get her man, uh, My Little Margie with Gail Storm, uh, and also you had Ed Southern and Southern here uh, with uh, Executive Secretary. And the Donna Reed Show. Donna Reed, the first woman who is the central family character uh, in a sitcom, or on TV for that matter. And uh, Spring Byington, December Bride. And then there was the first sitcom on TV. yoo Mrs. Goldberg, Gertrude Berg, moved the show from radio into TV. It was about a Jewish family assimilating into the United States, and Philip Loeb was her husband, but he was outed as a communist. And uh, Gertrude Berg would have to force him off the show. She didn't want to. They slipped him some money after he was gone. Uh, if you, um, the, the um, movie, which you might have in the library, called The Front with Woody Allen and Zero Mostel, basically captures that era. And uh, Loeb committed suicide eventually. Uh, because his um, occupation was taken away. He was good friends with Zero Mostel. He was accused of being a communist. Meanwhile, Arthur Duncan was on the Betty White Show, and he was um, tap dancer, and Betty liked him. 
and everybody seemed to like him except the network executives and the sponsors and they had a meeting with Betty White, said, we love your show, we love all this, we love all that, except there is one major problem. The major problem was Arthur Duncan. It's, uh, you gotta get rid of him. And Betty said, I'm not getting rid of him, you're getting rid of me, and she quit. Um, you had the Westerns, Playhouse 90, Cowboys and Indians, you had Gary Moore, you had Art Link Leather, you had soap operas, variety shows, I'm not gonna comment on that. Uh, you had uh, Maynard G. Krebs on the Dobie Gillis show at the end of the 1950s, uh, the first beatnik on television. He has a ripped sweatshirt, has a love of jazz, uses the like vocabulary. The many loves of Dobie Gillis would have a profound influence on Gary Marshall when he put together Happy Days. Four teenagers were the lead of Dobie Gillis. Four teenagers would be the lead of Happy Days. Quiz show scandals, well, some of the games were cooked, and um, it would never have been known, except Herbert Stemple went to Jack O'Brien of the New York Journal of American and said he took a dive. Uh, some of the shows were cooked, and uh, Congress got involved, signed new laws that prohibited the fixing of quiz shows. Bob Barker was on TV with Truth or Consequences back then, but that wasn't a quiz show. Game shows have more regulatory rules than new shows to assure their legitimacy. Which brings us up to this. This is Jeopardy. Well, Merv Griffin had hosted the show. Uh, the show was uh, on uh, CBS, called, or NBC rather, called uh, Play Your Hunch. It was a Goodson Todman show. He learned all about how to put together game shows. And he decided around 1962-63, that uh, he too wanted to be a game show producer and a quiz show, but he was worried about the quiz show scandal. So he's driving around with his wife, Julian, at the time, and he's telling her, I wanna put this show on, I wanna put this show on, I don't know if I can, I don't know. And she says, Merv, what's the problem? He said, well, you know, you gotta ask questions. It's where they got in, in trouble. And Julian says, well, give them the answers. Um, and you, you know, they supply the questions. So like, uh, 5,280 feet, how much is a mile? The light bulb went on. This is Jeopardy, and that's how that show started. John Cameron Swayze was the first uh, newscaster, network news, really, uh, and invented what you see now. And uh, it was the makers of Camel Cigarettes that brought you the latest news events right into your own living room. Sit back, light up a camel and be an eyewitness to the happenings that made history in the last 24 hours. It started February 16, 1949, but there was some censorship. R.J. R. J. Reynolds was the, uh, uh, Camel Cigarettes, R.J. Reynolds, the parent company, was putting up the money, so they said no smoking signs. Uh, cigars, no smoking of cigars except for Winston Churchill, and do not report on the Korean War. Edward R. Morrow would take down Joe McCarthy uh, on March 9th, 1954, a report on Senator Joe McCarthy on See It Now, where Morrow uh, put up his case as to why Joe McCarthy was a bad, bad guy. McCarthy wanted equal time, and he got it in April. And that was a mistake because Morrow eviscerated him and uh, McCarthy just uh, ran out of prominence after that, uh, although they were still, the House of Un-American Activities would continue. Uh, good Night and Good Luck, which was put together by Mark Cuban and uh, George Clooney is probably in the library, and I know Mark, and he owes me a copy of that. We get to the 1960s, and Richard Nixon and John Kennedy changed how presidential races are won with TV becoming very prominent. If you look at John Kennedy, he's got a dark suit. It matches the backdrop, most people have black and white TVs, of the uh, studio, WBM, BBM and Chicago Channel 2. And you look at Richard Nixon, he looks like a train wreck. He's got a bad knee, he's sweating, he's got a five o'clock shadow. He looked like he walked off the IRT subway back uh, on July 23rd, 1960, 95 degree day, 100% humidity. He looks terrible. It's the first debate where people start saying, does he look presidential or not? Uh, the first Nixon-Kennedy debate would change politics. Television would become the force because of visuals. This guy, Newton Minow, 1961, 
the vast wasteland talking about TV. And there's the skipper of the minnow. Hmm, interesting, same names. He spells his name M-I-N-O-W and the minnow is M-I-N-N-O-W. Well, uh, Gilligan's Island's boat uh, was named after Newton Minnow because the executive director, Sherwood Schwartz, said that uh, Minnow was ruining TV. He gives a speech, talks about it was a vast wasteland. And we wrap up where no man has ever gone before. Star Trek. And who was the biggest Trekkie of them all? Lucille Ball. She was the most powerful executive, woman executive in Hollywood. She ran the Desilu Studios, and she was making decisions on television shows. Now, she didn't particularly like it, but she takes over the studio in 1962, and her new husband, Gary Morton's in charge, and the studio is real is hemorrhaging money, and Lucy decides to take over on a day-to-day -day basis and starts to say yes and no to shows. She says yes to Mission Impossible. Uh, and then there's Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. And uh, he comes in and she thinks it's about USO uh, tours and performers performing for the armed forces. And he says, no, 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 no. It's Wagon Train, which was a popular show at that time, uh, in space. And Lucy is kind of interested in it, but uh, the, the pilot's going to cost a lot of money. Uh, to to shoot you know the pilot is a show that it's a practice show but basically shows what the show is about and the network executives look at it and uh the network executives did look at it at nbc and said no 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 we do not like it except except see that guy see that guy with the pointed ears why don't you build a show around him now initially the paramount People said, we don't, uh, not the Paramount people, she'd sell the Paramount. Initially, the Desi Lu people told Lucy, uh-uh-uh, no, don't put up Mission Impossible, clear winner. This one, clear loser. It would just kill us financially. And Lucy said, no, we're going to do it. The pilot, the cage flop. Uh, the next one, where no man has ever gone before, Spock is the only one left over. Lucille Ball says, yeah, we're going to reshoot this. Or the director said, no, 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 no. And Lucy says, yes. At the end of the day, who was correct? What is Star Trek and that franchise worth? Billions of dollars. She knew talent. She was the most powerful woman in Hollywood. She just wasn't that uh, actress who played Lucy McGillicuddy. I want to thank Anna for inviting me. I am so sorry that my computer crashed. Uh, hopefully that will never happen again. Uh, and uh, thank you, Adder, for inviting me. And uh, I will splice this thing up and uh, we will have a recording. Sounds great. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. We got the Super Bowl talk. Exactly. Have okay. a great night. Have a good night. Uh, be safe and um, be careful out there. Yep, Take care. You too. Bye-bye.